payment notices and pay less notices issued pursuant to that interim payment process if those payments weren't made. Um, and the third one was the right to adjudicate a dispute. So, you know, in some ways, you know, that makes us really special in construction, because as I say, you know, no other um, business type or industry sector, you know, has these rights um, because they're enshrined in acts of part and an act of parliament. You can't contract out of them. So even if you sign up to a contract to say, you know, nothing in the Housing Grants Constriction Regeneration Act applies between us, um, that has absolutely zero effect um, because um, there was a, a certain background to why this was introduced by the government of the time and that background um, and, you know, you might you might sort of recognise this is still applying to a great extent. The background was, you know, quite long supply chains, um, supply chains where, for example, contractors and subcontractors might be starved of cash through the project, but still have to do the work. Um, and that may, might lead to insolvency. And we had, you know, substantial insolvencies in construction. Um, quite often due to cash flow, not necessarily because, you know, the the businesses weren't well run um, and, you know, quite a dispute culture. Um, and so the government decided that they needed to do something to protect the supply chain in construction. So, you know, that might still ring a bell because to an extent, um, you know, we're still quite dispute orientated and it's the nature of the work. It's, you know, it's all unique. You know, it's not like um, building a car. Um, so, you know, there are always going to be issues. You know, the risk um, basis, you know, is often quite tough for contractors and subcontractors. Um, so um, certainly the Act, you know, has has alleviated some of the problems. Um, but probably not all of them. And of course, in terms of the payment process, um, we've seen, you know, lots of quite complicated issues going to court. Um, so, you know, that's that's not as clear cut as it, you know, it should possibly be um, when you take account of the fact that it's um, something that, you know, people who are on construction projects have to operate on a you know daily stroke monthly basis. So that's the background to it. That's, you know, why, you know, we've ended up with this unique act. So so what does it do? Well, in terms of adjudication, just really high level, it allows us to go to adjudication, which, you know, high level is a 28 day process. So, you know, you will get a decision within 28 days. It's not quite like that. And we'll come back to the timescales later. So. Um, what it does is it avoids having to start either arbitration or court proceedings. So arbitration and court are pretty much the same. Um, arbitration is like a private form of court proceedings. Um, typically, you know, if you start court proceedings today, you might get to trial in 12 to 18 months. And, you know, it's similar for arbitration. So you can see why a 28 day adjudication process um, is is ideal. Um, also, um, you know, if you're paying for lawyers over a 12, 18 month process, you know, it's going to be far more expensive than a 28 day process. Um, but that comes with the caveat that, and this is the third bullet point, adjudication resolves disputes, but it's on an interim basis. So what does that mean? Does it mean that you, you know, you might not get paid the money you've been awarded? Well, usually no. The general rule is, and we'll see situations next month, you know, where the general rule might not apply, but the general rule is the sums awarded in adjudication must be paid. But once they've been paid, the party who's unhappy with the award, and that could be either party, um, can still go to arbitration or court um, and have the matter dealt with by court as if from scratch. So pretty much ignoring the fact that what 
the, you know, as to what the adjudicator has found, you know, everything starts again. Um, so, you know, you can do that. Now, in reality, what we've found is that parties generally accept the adjudicator's decision for, for good or for bad. And I think there are two reasons for that. The first is that the parties sort of think, well, somebody independent has had a look at it and reached a decision. So, you know, if I've not done as well as I'd hoped or, you know, if we've lost in a worse way than we'd anticipated, you know, kind of so be it. It could get worse with a judge or an arbitrator. You know, it might not necessarily get better. And I think the second reason is that um, adjudication is a very intense process, particularly during that 28 day period, which often gets extended. And I think often the parties just think, you know, I, I don't want to kind of continue um, going through this process. You know, we've we've kind of got as much as we can out of it. Um, and quite often, you know, um, parties are quite kind of jade, not jaded by the whole process, but um, exhausted by it. Um, and I must say that, you know, when I've had clients who haven't adjudicated before, I always warn them about this. And at the end, quite often, they'll say, you know, you warned us, but actually, we didn't realise how intense and how time consuming it would be. So, you know, and, you, you know, not not unlike construction projects, you know, that can become quite intense. Um, but I suspect that, you know, sat preparing witness statements, working weekends, etc., um, isn't what people anticipate um, when they think that they'll go into adjudication. And it is very much a team sport. So it's not something that you can say to your lawyers, oh, can you just get on with that? And we'll, you know, we'll we'll get on with the project. Um, you know, it's it needs input from people who know what's happened on site, you know, as well as the lawyers. Uh, next slide, please. So the interim, you know, basis that we saw in the last slide, um, you know, the, the adjudicators award is um, binding on an interim basis. This is where we get the pay first, argue later, i.e. get your adjudication award, got to observe it so if somebody's got to pay something they pay um, and then they can go to court and argue later um so the next bullet point we've dealt with that 28 day process and we've got there the act the housing grants construction and regeneration act 19, 1996 it has been amended um in 2011 um just some, some relatively minor amendments. So it can be used to resolve a wide range of disputes um, and it's unique to, con to sorry, court proceedings and arbitration proceedings in that you don't need to refer all the dispute to um, adjudication. You can cherry pick items. So if as a claiming party, you know, you have a big variation, a single compensation event, um, you know, the ideal scenario would be, you know, you think it's fairly clear cut. It is a compensation event um, um, and it's clear cut as to the time and the money involved, but PM won't, won't agree it. You know, you could adjudicate that one item, um, hopefully win that and then, you know, hope that that will make the paying party kind of come to the table and try to negotiate other disputed items. Um, but in court proceedings, you can't do that. You can't keep going backwards and forwards to court with new issues, having a trial on it. And then, oh, we've got another new issue. Um, you've got to bring all of your known claims to court at the same time. So that's, you know, that's where adjudication proves useful. Now, having said that, and that was the idea behind adjudication that, I don't know, perhaps, you know, a few months into a project interim application for is made, um, it's certified, it's substantially lower, um, contractor's not happy, subcontractor is not happy, one of them decides to adjudicate, quick adjudication, um, get a result and keep doing the work and, you know, get the result and keep progressing things. Um, but actually, it's not 
as rough and ready as I think the Act of Parliament had anticipated. Um, the legal arguments are, you know, very, very good legal arguments that are put forward. You know, all the kind of arguments that you'd expect to be put forward to a court. The evidence put forward is very detailed, you know, quite similar to what you'd expect would be put forward in court proceedings. So typically, um, you know, it would have to be quite a high value, discreet item to bring. Or usually what it is, is pretty much a final account or an interim account towards the end of the project where possibly the payment delta um, is getting quite um, extensive. Um, the other thing to point out is this final bullet point is that usually um, it's dealt with by way of written submissions only. So you don't ever have a trial type of situation um, at the start. So, you know, back in late 1990s, early 2000s, we would often um, find that an adjudicator would want to have a meeting with the parties. And in which case that would be all both parties together, not the adjudicator meeting one party and then the other. It's all got to be done in the open. Um, but that's that's pretty rare um, at the moment. And these things come in trends. You know, we might, you know, revert back to having meetings. Um, and, you know, there's always the rogue um, matter where you might find that you have a meeting. Um, in Scotland, they um, the adjudicators tend to have meetings as opposed not um, having them. So just be careful there if you've got projects in Scotland. Um, you might find that um, you're adjudicating them and you do have a meeting. And sometimes they can be quite formal. Um, so I had one where, you know, we were we had witnesses giving evidence and being cross-examined in the same way as you would at court. Um, you know, very, very, very formal. Um, so, you know, again, you know, if you're preparing for an adjudication, it's worth, you know, um, checking, you know, which jurisdiction you're in. Um, you know, England, Scotland, you know, you might be doing a project in Northern Ireland. Um, you know, they all have different rules. Um, next, next slide, please. Sorry, not different. Next slide, yeah. Uh, not different rules, but different um, customs and practices. So moving on to the kind of technical requirements under the Act. Um, so the the Act um, is states pretty much that um, a party to a construction contract. So we'll come back to the definition of construction contract because it doesn't include every element of construction. Um, but a party to a construction contract can refer a dispute to adjudication at any time. So there are a few things to unpick in there. The first one is the construction contract, and we'll come on to that. And the second one is can refer a dispute. And out of that comes two things. Um, the first thing is that a dispute and this case law that shows this means one dispute. So you can't refer to separate disputes. Now, having said that, um, a final account, um, it, a lot easier um, in NEC or you know, an NEC interim payment application can be referred as one dispute, even though, so for example, under a JCT final account or a JCT interim payment application, you might have a number of things, payment for work done, um, payment for variations, extension of time, loss and expense relating to that. But if it's all in one interim payment application, it's one dispute. And um, in contrast, if, for example, you had something like a declaration um, as to wrongful termination um, and um, some variations um, and um, uh, an extension of time claim that had been submitted. If they, they were all, they might all be deemed to be separate items and therefore a number of disputes. So you just need to be aware of that. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so that's one dispute. And also, um, there, there is case law around whether you have a dispute or not. So, you know, if you, as in the second bullet point, 
if you claim a sum of money, you need to give the other side the opportunity to respond and sort of decide, you know, am I going to pay it? Am I not? Ditto if you've applied for an extension of time under JCT or NEC, you know, if you've submitted um, a compensation notification, you know, has the other party had time um, to respond? What are the time limits under the contract? Have they come back within those time limits, you know, and said yes or no? Um, so, you know, it's it's usually fairly obvious that there's a dispute because the other party has said, no, I don't agree. I'm not going to pay you that money. I'm not giving you that extra time. But just just be careful um, about whether a dispute has arisen. And what, what you'll see is the lawyers refer to it as, you know, a dispute having crystallised. And that just means, is there, a, you know, is there a genuine dispute or is it just that one party's made a claim and the other party hasn't responded? Now, you know, in circumstances where the contract doesn't set deadlines for a response, um, what the case law says is that if there's been no response within a reasonable period, then the other party's deemed to have basically said, no, you know, I'm not going to pay, I'm not going to give you that, and a dispute will have arisen. But obviously, you know, soon as we get into that, you know, have you given them a reasonable period of time? You know, it it becomes a little bit muddy. So in the ideal situation where there's no specified time scale, you'd probably go back and say, you know, we've sent, you know, it wouldn't apply to an interim payment application because the contract always contains time scales. But, you know, we've we've issued this extension of time. You know, are you going to grant it or not? Do you agree it or not? Um, you know, you've had two weeks, you know, are you going to respond? And if they still don't respond, and um, you know, then I think it's probably safe that you do have a dispute. Uh, next slide, please. So the first point I made, you know, in this, the Act says, you know, a party to a construction contract may refer a dispute to adjudication at any time. Um, it refers to construction contracts. So I've already said um, it, you know, it doesn't um, apply um, to everything. So, for example, a supplier to the construction industry. Um, doesn't doesn't count as a construction contract. So, you know, the if uh, bricks or whatever are delivered to site and that's all it is, supply and delivery, that's not a construction contract. So what the Act says is a construction contract involves the carrying out of a construction operation, which is relatively wide. It includes all those things um, that you might need to to come within the act so construction alteration repair maintenance extension demolition dismantling so that's where it's wide it also is wide in that it includes design so architectural design engineering and um, surveying work interior exterior decoration um, and landscaping so you can see that's quite wide uh, next slide please Jan. Um, however, there are some items that it doesn't include. So if we go straight down to the bottom bullet point and the last item is domestic dwelling, dwellings. So possibly for you, that's not, not relevant um, because when we're talking about domestic dwellings, we are talking about the contractor building a house for the person who is going to occupy it. Um, so basically, that's to protect consumers. Um, you know, the government the, at the time that introduced the act, they didn't want the consumer, you know, building their dream home um, to suddenly find that they were being adjudicated. And, you know, what does that mean? You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm just somebody who wants, you know, my my house built. Um, so, so they, you know, that kind of work is excluded. But if you're house building for, you know, the house building businesses, then that is not excluded from the Act because you're not building for the person who's going to live in the house. You're building for somebody who's going to sell it on. Um, 
also in that second bullet point, there are other um, uh, exclusions to the definition of construction operation. So PFI projects, uh, however, they often quite um, have their own quite detailed dispute resolution mechanisms and um, development agreements where a lease is involved and um, insurance contracts and finance contracts. So they're probably fairly discreet and probably not that relevant um, to, to you. Um, the first bullet point um, is another list of items that do not come within the definition of construction operations. So you don't get any of those three benefits. You don't get the right to interim payments. Um, you don't get the right to suspend the work if payments not made properly. Um, and you don't get the right to adjudicate disputes. Now, there's no, whereas, you know, homeowner, there's a little bit of logic there protecting the consumer. There's no real logic here except a number of industries lobbied the government when they were introducing the or when they were proposing the act. And they were basically saying, look, we don't have disputes like they do in, as they have in the mainstream construction. And um, so we don't need this act. Now, you know, to me, that begs the question, well, if you don't need it because you don't have disputes, um, you'll be happy um, for it to be included, because if you don't have disputes, you don't need adjudication or court. Um, but um, that was that was their position. We don't need it in our industry. Um, and the government therefore excluded certain works um, from um, the Act. Now, just as a high level, these exclusions are works that are predominantly around kind of processing works. So the ones that are excluded drilling for oil or gas are probably not relevant and um, tunneling or boring. Um, and then this this next one, which is quite complex, um, there's been a fair amount of case law on it, but possibly um, might apply. So this is the assembly or demolition. So that's basically to cover both um, of plant or machinery. Now, plant and machinery has been widely defined. So don't think of this as just, you know, very high tech equipment that's, you know, um, created and brought to brought to site. Um, you know, it's it's quite wide. So it's demolition, assembly or demolition of plant or machinery where the primary activity is nuclear processing, power generation, or the production, transmission, or processing of chemicals for the pharmaceuticals industry. Um, it's it's actually. Um, quite a bit wider than that because it includes food processing and there's also um, one that talks about um, processing of water um, and sewage treatment plants um, which um, you know grounds works often get caught by. So you're looking here at these processing industries um, and you know, if you are carrying out, which is the assembly or demolition of plant or machinery. Um, there's also another item, which is um, steel work to support that plant or machinery, which is why it kind of gets quite um, convoluted. Um, essentially, um, the case law says that if um, you are contributing basically to the process so for example if you are and I appreciate you know kind of it's it's not your area but if you're the electrical um people who are installing even just the electrical cables that you know join one piece of the process to the next then the chances are that your work will be excluded from construction operation um, because what the case law says is that anything um, that makes that operation, that process element work is excluded, as opposed to the building that just keeps it watertight, that's not excluded um, because it's not, 
essential for the actual process to work. So that seems to be the distinction at the moment. Um, but I think the key thing is if you just sort of keep an eye on projects and if you kind of get an inkling that it's in any of these areas, what you need to do is investigate further when you're negotiating the contract. And if necessary, just require a clause to go in to say, you know, notwithstanding what the Act says, um, the parties are entitled to adjudicate as if the Act applied so that you preserve your right to adjudicate. Because the problem now is in construction, if you don't have the right to adjudicate, typically you've got to go off to court or arbitration. And of course, we're just not really set up for that. It's too time consuming. It's too expensive. Um, and really, it operates as a deterrent to being able to pursue matters um, and, you know, get a dispute raised. You end up as, you know, the party who is likely to be the claiming party, you know, with your hands tied behind your back because you know you don't want to go to court, you don't want to go to arbitration because we're used to that nice 28 day quick pro quickish process. Uh, next slide, please, Jen. OK, so what does the Act say? You know, how does adjudication um, apply? And in some ways, you know, it is. It's it's not too prescriptive. So this slide says, and it's a little bit odd to get your head around it. The Act of Parliament says that a construction contract, so, you know, the ones that aren't excluded in the way that we've looked at, construction contract has to include the following items that are included in the sub bullet points. Now, just a little bit of a spoiler alert, what happens um, if um, your contract doesn't contain one of these items? Well, basically, the Act says that you basically ditch the contract in that regard um, and you revert to what's called the scheme for construction contracts, which is a statutory instrument, so again, introduced by Parliament at the time um, with, with the Act. So it sort of is an add-on to the Act and it says how parties operate if the Act hasn't complied, been complied with. So if the Act doesn't, com doesn't contain all of these sub-bullet points. So this is why you will see contracts that contain this information. So the first one is, and it's it, this is why I say it's a little bit odd to get your head around it, because it's an act of parliament dictating what a contract should say. And we're not used to that in construction. You know, we're used to our contracts saying what we want them to say. And, you know, that's a fundamental point of um contracting but of course if you think about say employment law that's a contract between an employer and an employee but there is absolutely tons of you know acts of parliament legislation saying you know how mainly the employer has to treat the employee um, in a good way not in a bad way um, and this is similar but of course in construction we're just not used to being told what we've got to put in our contract so the first thing is the contract has to um, allow a party either party to give a notice um, at any time of his or her intention to refer a dispute to adjudication so we'll see what role the notice has in all of this but it's got to allow it. So it's got to, you know, say that you can do this. The next thing, it's got to provide a timetable for the appointment of the adjudicator and the referral of the dispute um, within seven days of the notice. Um, now, typically, what that requires, and NEC is exact, is, it is mirrors this. So it requires the notice to be issued on day one, for example. So this is the party starting the adjudication. Um, the notice, what does it say? It's sort of a very brief document. It says who the parties are, what the contract is, what, you know, what date it is, what type of contract it is. Um, 
and you know some of the fundamental points and what the adjudication provisions are state what the dispute is very very briefly and what remedy is sought so payment of you know half a million pounds um you know non-payment of um interim payment application whatever the dispute is so that's served on day one and so we've seen that within seven days um, the parties have got to refer the matter to adjudication. So usually the timetable in those seven days is notice issued day one. Then within those seven days, the referring party's got to do two things. The first is they've got to get the adjudicator nominated. And the second is they've got to serve the referral, which is the detailed adjudication papers and all the supporting documentation or the legal argument, as opposed to that brief document, which is the notice. So the referral, um, you know, as I say, it will have all the backup information, all the quantum, et cetera. So how do you get the, so that's the first one. How do you get the adjudicator nominated? Well, they might be named into the, into the contract, Fred blogs, Frieda blogs, that's quite rare. Typically, the contract will state who the nominating body is. So the referring party, once they've served the notice on the other party, they can then set to work and get the nominating body to appoint the adjudicator. But they've got to do that within that seven day period so that the adjudicator has been nominated. The parties know who the adjudicator is so that when the referral document is served, that detailed document, um, it can be served on both the other party and the adjudicator at the same time. So how do you um, get the nominating body um, to, to nominate someone? Nominating bodies include RICS, ICE, there's lots of them. Typically, if you look in their, on their websites under dispute resolution, ICE, um, I think, divides theirs into adjudication and arbitration. Look at the adjudication one, look at the right one. Um, so look at adjudicator and there's a form to fill in, appointing an adjudicator, want a few details, who are the parties again. Usually they'll want to see the notice of adjudication that's already been served. Um, and I think with ICE, they say they'll nominate someone within four days. Um, I usually ask them to nominate someone as soon as they can. Um, and, um, you know, they, they will then nominate. And what you will do is you'll get an email from the um, ICE or RICS or whoever telling you who they've nominated. And the other party will get that email as well. And then the adjudicator typically will contact both parties by email. And the critical thing there is that from then on, as soon as the adjudicator has been nominated, any communication that one of the parties sends to the adjudicator, they have to copy the other party in. So it's full transparency. There is, you know, what is not allowed is one party emailing the adjudicator and saying, you know, this is a secret email, you know, don't tell the other side, but this is what I want to say. You know, it's all transparent. And it's, you know, email is great for that because you email the adjudicator and you copy um, the other party in. So it's all above board. Um, and it's, um, you know, the, the adjudicator, one of the first things they do when they um, start the communication with the parties just after they've been appointed is to say, you know, just be clear, if you're emailing me, you've got to copy the other party. If you're sending me documents, you've got to send them. You've got to copy them to the other party as well. Um, so we've gone off track a bit. What another point that the contract, the Act says the contract has to do is to require the adjudicator to reach a decision within 28 days of the referral. So bear that in mind, because obviously we know that that comes um, up to seven days after that notice. So the 28 day period starts from the referral not from the earlier date when the notice has been served. 
It also allows the parties between them to agree a longer period if they want to, but they can only reach that agreement after the adjudication has been referred. So you can't have any mechanism in the contract that says, you know, we will agree an extension or the adjudicator has 45 days or anything like that. Um, this is all designed um, to allow a fair process because typically it's the party um, engaging um, the, the contractor or the subcontractor um, in a subcontract who has the kind of negotiating powers in contracts. So the idea here is that um, in contracts, you can't kind of water down the adjudication provisions, make it longer, make it more time consuming, etc. Also, the Act requires that contract should, so this is the fourth bullet point, allow the adjudicator to extend the 28 days by up to 14, so no longer than 14, if the referring party, the party who started the adjudication, consents. So, you know, it just gives the adjudicator and the referring party a bit of flexibility without needing the responding party to agree. Next point, contract has to impose a duty on the adjudicator to act impartially. You know, that's hopefully fairly obvious. Um, the adjudicator shouldn't be partisan for one party or the other. Um, so just, you know, if you're a contractor in a contract, subcontractor in a subcontract, just be aware of these provisions where an adjudicator is named. I don't like them um, from a contractor and subcontractor perspective because you know you've got to question you know if you're an adjudicator and you know that a particular employer always names you in their contracts as the adjudicator you know is that going to sway your decision potentially and um, you know you're potentially going to get lots of work out of it and adjudicators don't act for free you know you, they have to be paid so it's you know it's their income it's their livelihood um you know are they want to go into you know are they going to want to um you know um you know slightly um even un unconsciously skew things and i think even if you've got you know confidence that they wouldn't um you know it it just gives you greater confidence in the decision if it's been somebody who's been nominated, you know, and is has no relation um, to the parties or the project. Um, and finally, um, the Act requires that the contract um, allows the adjudicator um, to take the initiative in ascertaining the facts and the law. And what you do find in adjudication from time to time is that adjudicators will ask questions. Um, you know, on occasions they'll, you know, submit a list of questions, you know, relevant to the, the, the specific facts. Uh, next slide, please, Jen. Um, so, yeah, we've already covered this, so we can move on to the next slide. Um, and it just, just points out that you move on to the scheme for construction contracts if your contract doesn't cover um, those points. Um, we've covered this, so this is the point you can refer a dispute, so it's only one dispute, so we've covered that, um, those two points, if we can move on to the next slide please, we're on a roll now, um, and we've covered this one, so this is about has the dispute crystallised, has the other side had the opportunity um, to respond to it, and if we can move on to the next slide please Jan. Um, yeah, so just a couple of things on this because we have on the whole covered them. Um, first of all, the second bullet point, what's the limitation period in a contract? Now, that's unlikely to apply to, say, a final account um, um, that's being pursued by um adjudication but bear in mind you know the standard limitation period under statute so another act of parliament is that it's six years under a simple contract 
um, and it's 12 years under a deed, which brings me on to something I wanted to mention, which is related to our last seminar, if you were here, which was construction case law. Several of the cases dealt with collateral warranties where there were arguments by parties complaining about defective work that they wanted to bring an adjudication against the contractor or subcontractor for defective works. Um, and what they were saying was the um, collateral warranty is a construction contract because it's for construction operations, so I can adjudicate it. So just, just a reminder about that, be careful of collateral warranties um, that you have to enter into um, that might be deemed to be a construction contract. So we covered that last month. Um, also, you know, you might be thinking, well, we've also got this idea that you can um, refer a construction contract to adjudication where you've got a dispute. And I said at any time, so you can refer it at any time. Um, that's subject to the limitation periods. Um, so if you're outside of limitation, you can't. Um, but you might also be thinking, well, you know, there are various, for example, final um, account provisions in JCT. Now we've got them in NEC4, which say, you know, if you don't dispute this within four weeks or however many weeks, um, then it's deemed binding and conclusive on the parties. So how does that marry up with being able to adjudicate a dispute at any time? Well, the answer to that is um, that if you don't dispute the figure um, in the final account within the time set to comply with the contract mechanisms, then what the clauses typically say is you deem to have agreed them. And that gets over the, you know, dis refer a dispute at any time, because what the courts will say and what they do say is, well, you haven't got a dispute. So you there's nothing to refer at any time. So it's not the at any time that applies. It's the fact that you don't have a dispute because you haven't challenged within the time scale allowed. And the contract says you have deemed to have agreed it. So you can't have a dispute because it's agreed, even though you're not happy with it. So that's how that works. Um, think about third bullet point, how will adjudication impact on business relations? Um, you know, I'm not saying that that should stop a party adjudicating, you know, but it is something that needs to be considered. Um, you know, I've seen instances of, um, I would say, you know, agreed referrals where the parties have sort of agreed that yes they'll get they'll go to adjudication to get a third party to you know determine it and they almost agree it'll be you know a friendly adjudication um but at the end you know sometimes you know it doesn't you, you know the parties don't come out friendly from the process and that's partly because you know it's such a detailed intense process um and you know by its by you know virtue of what it is um you know it's not necessarily a friendly process you know each party you know is seeing things written um about them that they're not happy about um so you know it's not always easy to maintain that you know we'll uh, we agree to adjudicate on the basis that you know it gives us a third party determination but you know, it doesn't affect our working relationship moving forward. And then the final point on here is kind of getting to the nub of preparing. So this is about, you know, predominantly about the documentation. So, you know, paper trail. Um, so, of course, now paper trail is typically in emails, sometimes texts, WhatsApps, um, minutes of meetings don't forget about those so more of that kind of thing than um you know letters you know say so very very few letters um so you know we're looking at having that paper trail of explaining you know what's being done on site and why and also you know in terms of the paper trail filling in the forms that the you know and the 
as part of the forms that the parties agree, whether by way of the kind of um, systems, um, you know, the IT processes that um, one of the parties operates to, or just generally the forms um, that have been agreed between the parties. Um, complete them. Um, we'll be looking a little bit at witness statements later. Um, but, you know, if you think about what you're doing, you know, or oh, probably better if you think about what you were doing, you know, this time three months ago, you know, if you had to do a witness statement on that, you know, you would really struggle. But if you know that you have a policy of, you know, either keeping detailed diary notes or you know, confirming things in emails to the other party. You know, you've got a really good log um, of what's gone on that will a remind you, um, because I can guarantee. Well, first of all, um, you know, you might be asked. You know, if you were asked today, what were you doing three months ago? You probably wouldn't have any idea. Um, but then, when you start looking at documents, your memory improves, and it's amazing how much more you can recollect as things you know as things go on and you see you know see the documents to remind you and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that and um, the other thing is that um without any documents a your memory you know you've got little to remind you to set those triggers off and um, but also without any documents it is very much one party's word against the other which is always difficult um, for a third party to assess in terms of, you know, who, you know, who's who's speaking the truth here. And sometimes it's sort of somewhere slightly in the middle. So, you know, keep that paper trail. It doesn't need to be, you know, aggressive or unpleasant. You know, it can just be done in a friendly, amicable way. You know, thanks for, you know, thanks for your time earlier you know, really pleased, you know, we were able to make some progress, you know, just to confirm you've instructed us to do A, B and C, um, et cetera, et cetera. You know, or, you know, as with NEC, you know, if you're required to issue notices, you know, issue the notices, um, you know, and you might want to put, you know, a covering email in with it, you know, you know, we've, we need to comply with the NEC. So, you know, I've submitted a whatever you know, notification today, you know, let me know if you've got any queries, you know, so it doesn't need to be aggressive. It can hopefully, um, you know, maintain, um, you know, the, the, the relationships on site. Um, also, you know, documents evidencing liability. So photographs are great. Um, site reports um, you know, anything that shows what is going on on site, and of course, photographs nowadays are all dated. Um, um, in particular, as well, um, programs. So, you know, there'll be hopefully numerous programs if you're working under NEC, which is, you know, such a fantastic um, scheme of evidence to show how a program, um, a project um, has progressed, and um, particularly if you know, they've been submitted to the other side and even more so if they've been agreed and accepted as you've gone along. Um, and also documents um, evidence in quantum. Um, so particularly um, invoices um, for materials, invoices for labour, um, timesheets for parties um, to show particularly when they were working on the specific piece of work in question, the variation work um, that, you know, um, um, time spent, you know, for periods of delay by the site, you know, the site team, the QS, the programmer, et cetera. Um, you know, and the other thing is that all of this documentation, and I always say, you know, I realize it's tedious. It's not, you know, it's not very exciting, um, but, the point is that having this documentation and having it ready um, so that you can prove an adjudication actually means that you are less likely to have to progress to adjudication 
because you've got that documentation that you can show to the other party to show them that your claim is valid and also when they've seen that they will realise also that you know you are effectively ready you are able to adjudicate you know you've got the supporting documents which will mean that they are more likely to try to settle things and um, whereas you know if the paying party can see that um a party's you know the, the party the contractor the subcontractor has very little supporting evidence you know they will then be thinking well how does this how will this pan out with the adjudicator potentially not very well for them uh, next slide please Um, I think we've, oh, I think we've maybe gone on about two slides too quickly. Uh, um, yeah, so um, we can, we, um, that's fine, yeah. Uh, one more slide, that's the one we've just done. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Um, OK, so. Uh, um, OK, so the documents um, in, an, in an adjudication, so what I call the pleadings, which is a court phrase, but the pleadings are um, and I sort of think about this as a sort of um, a pyramid structure um, where you have your sort of court style documents. So usually the ones prepared by um, the lawyers, you know, at the top of that pyramid, because in some ways they're the high level documents that refer um, and spread out to all the other documents below in the pyramid. So those pleadings will consist of that notice of adjudication. If you remember that very brief document that starts the process and then the referral which is the full submission. So typically the referral um, contains all the legal arguments. It'll refer to all of the other documents. So they will be witness statements. There might be expert reports. So a delay expert there might be a quantum expert. Um, and to me, the bottom of that pyramid, the most voluminous part of the documentation is that project documentation, which hopefully shows how important it is. So they're the minutes of meetings, the emails, your photographs, um, your supporting quantum, the programmes submitted and agreed throughout the project. Um, also, so this is the fourth bullet point, once the referral notice is submitted, the rules of natural justice, so they're Fair play to both parties mean that the other party has the right to respond. So they do that in a response. So that kind of speaks for itself. Once the response has come in, there may be new issues that have arisen. It might all be new to the to the referring party, to the claiming party. So typically the party who started the adjudication will get the opportunity to send a reply, to reply to the response. Any other submissions will be a rejoinder from the party defending. Um, and there might also be what's called a surrejoinder, where the party who started the process gets the last say, which is it's probably the norm for the, the, the party, um, that party to get the, the last say. It depends um, on the extent to which new arguments are raised. So they're that kind of. For each one of those submissions, it will be a pyramid structure, um, but it's sort of cumulative. So you've got the pyramid for the referral, which has the referral at the top, witness statements and reports underneath, and then all that supporting documentation. Um, then the response document will have its own witness statements, might have some extra um, project documentation, but you know, substantially should use the documentation in the referral. So then the reply comes you know, back to the referring party. Again, you have the reply at the top. You might have some extra witness statements. 
but it will be topping up and responding to the response um, and it'll be adding to the information that's already been given in the referral. And there might be a few extra project documents, but probably not too many, just a few extra points. Um, and um, it goes along like that. So the final bullet point is two, two aims really, you know, apart from all your legal argument and your documents, um, you know, there are there are two kind of strategic points here. The first is to make everything as clear as possible and as easy to read for the adjudicator as possible. So, you know, guide them, you know, um, in the witness statements, you know, I said this to the other party and they and and this is shown in the email that I sent when I went back to the office. You know, the email is at page 27 of my bundle and, you know, you might want to actually quote what it says because quotes nice and easy. It means that the adjudicator can read it and they might not even need to then find the document. So it's about thinking about the easiest way of presenting it to make, well, the, the best way of presenting it to make it easy for the adjudicator to understand your position um, in as easy way as possible. And the other thing is, um, you know, part of disputes is about making yourself look like your, your party looking like you're the reasonable, sensible um, party. Um, so, you know, that's partly you know, giving them a clear case to follow with everything nicely um, cross-referenced. Um, and also, of course, it helps if you A, have all that project documentation, and also if that project documentation shows that you've, you know, you've dealt with things in a measured way, um, not too shouty. A little bit of frustration isn't a problem, but, you know, um, shouty bullying, doesn't, you know, doesn't look great, um, you know, when you're trying to persuade an adjudicator that, you know, actually we've been very reasonable, we're the, we're the good people here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, that's fine. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so we've covered experts fairly briefly. Um, Typically, what you would need on an account claim might be delay programming expert, might be quantum. Depends on the value of your claim, because obviously that bumps up your cost. Um, so, you know, for lots of claims, you might just want to use, particularly when you if you're on an NEC project, you'll have a, a programmer um, engaged, you know, operating on, on the project, you have quantity surveyors, so, you know, you might want them to deal with quantum. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, next, next slide, we can move on. Um, we've covered, yeah, so this is around sort of, um, making sure that everything's in a nice order. So, you know, having exhibits. So basically all of those project documents at the bottom of that pyramid that you give to the adjudicator, in my view, they should all be referred to in a document prepared for the adjudication in one way or another. So either in those legal documents at the top of the pyramid or in the witness statements or the expert reports slightly underneath it. If you've got documents that just aren't referred to at all, then query whether you actually need them or not, because what's, you, you know, you need to be guiding the adjudicator and saying why a particular document's exhibited, it's relevant because, um, so, um, you know, and that's where it's, you know, good to have this clear cross-referencing. And also, you know, this final bullet point, quite often a chronology is useful, and I quite like to have a chronology and append the relevant documents supporting it to it. So you can have a nice chart, you know, date of, date of the document, what happened, you know, um, uh, date, sorry, date and time, what happened and what it shows. Um, OK, next slide, please. 
um, yeah, missing documents. Um, if they just can't be located and you think they're useful, it's worth referring to them um, because typically they will have been emailed to the party, so they should have them. So it sort of encourages them um, to, to exhibit them. And if they don't, then it sort of suggests that they agree that it, it potentially helps um, the party who's lost them. If um, you just haven't got the documents, then you you kind of left in a position where you're going to have to try and recover the position um, through witness statements, which, you know, as we've discussed, is always going to be a challenge. Um, and next slide, please. So that's everything for today. Um, any questions? Bear in mind that um, next week is part, so next week, next month, is um, part two, which is actually dealing with um, the adjudication process itself. So Sarah, there is um, a couple of questions. I'm just conscious of time. So if it's okay with you, um, I'll send them over to you on email. Yeah. Um, and then if you can pop me an answer over, I'll send the answers out when I send the slides. Yeah, no, that's great. Would that work? Yeah, absolutely. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you for a lovely seminar. And guys, as Sarah's just mentioned, uh, next month it is sort of part two to this. So that's uh, Tuesday, the 27th of June at one o'clock. So if you want to register for that, if you haven't done so already, then you can do so on the Seek Yorkshire and Humber events page um, or just pop me an email over, like I say, and I can get you registered and um, send you out a certificate for CPD if anybody wants one. Right, we'll say thank you again then, Sarah. Um, and as I say, guys, we'll get some answers to your questions and I'll pop those out uh, on an email this week along with the PowerPoint slides. Thank you.